Hey guys, Vector Auto Regressions in Stata. Here we go. We're going to take a look at running uh, kind of the basic commands necessary to specify, estimate, and then interpret a Vector Auto Regression model. Uh, the example data set I'm using here, uh, we're focusing on this variable here, this RBAC, that's our return on Bank of America stock, versus uh, S&P return. And then we've added these macro factors merge them together from the uh, so our original asset data came from Yahoo Finance merge that together with our macro factors from the Federal Reserve economic database we've got our three-month t-bill rate and the effective federal funds rate all of this is daily observations uh, the basic idea here is we're gonna kind of generate a dynamic multi-factor cap in model we want to see how changes in these other factors exogenous shocks specifically in these other factors impact our asset return variable. So we're going to run this as a uh, four variable VAR, the assumption being all of these variables are influencing each other over time, right? So they're all, in a sense, endogenous variables. And the VAR is the, the perfect tool for, for that situation. So a good place to start uh, is using that command VAR SOC. So that's our uh, vector auto regression specification optimization uh, so it's going to run uh, with the variables that we we specify it's going to run all different lag lengths of a reduced form system and it's going to choose the system that gives us the minimum information criteria so all we have to do is list out the variables in no particular order at this point as we know the ordering is going to become important later on but it's just to give us an idea of of how many lags are going to give us the best fit. And we have here our various iterations of those information criterion. Uh, we're going to focus in on the AIC, the AKI-EK information criterion. And we see it, see it minimized here at lag three. So we'll go ahead and use that for our, our VAR system. Kind of a, a good next place to go uh, is to use that VAR basic command. Uh, the issue here is it going to run this kind of default VAR as purely a reduced form system? So we're not able to uh, impose a Cholesky ordering uh, or an identification scheme here. Uh, so it's going to make it difficult to provide a really useful interpretation to the resulting impulse response functions. But just to give us an idea of what we're looking for, uh, what we're dealing with, not a bad place to start. So again, the order in which we place the variables in this command doesn't play a role. So we could just go straight from top to bottom, our four variable system uh, in my case here. So as we know, the, uh, the VAR output, initially it's going to be our system of equations right? with all the estimated coefficients. And then on top of that, it gives us every combination of shock variable and response variable in our impulse responses. So we're going to maximize that. We can get it a little bit more clearly. Uh, we're going to be focusing in on this row, sorry, this column here. Uh, the way this is set up, it's VAR basic, and then the name of the shock variable followed by the response variable. So for this third column all the way down, these are the responses of our asset return, that B of A. Uh, stock return responding to shocks in each of the four variables in the system real hard to tell just because uh, the uh, the scale is going to be consistent across all the all the graphs uh, so we can't really zoom in and see what's happening this this guy here that's pretty promising right nope oh, sorry that's the that's the auto regress so that's a shock to the asset return and its response to that shock. Sorry, this is the one I wanted to look at. Uh, this is essentially the equivalent to our cap M beta effect, right? So it's the response of the asset return to a shock in the market as a whole. Looks like it's positive. Can't really tell if it's significant at all, so it's real hard to get much out of this in this case. Uh, so we'll then close that out, but just to quickly look at the regression results here right? so these are all of the estimated coefficients for equations 
and the way, oops, the way I did it here, I forgot to specify the lag length. That should have been three lags to follow what we got in the VAR SOC, uh, but the default is just two. So make sure you make that make that adjustment. Follow through with what you see in the uh, that specification step, and we'll be sure to do that for the for the next step. So before we estimate our our real version of the VAR, where we can impose a Cholesky ordering, we need to think through what that ordering might look like. So if you recall, the variable that's ordered first in our system, that's what we call the contemporaneously exogenous variable. So it doesn't respond contemporaneously to shocks in any of the other variables, but changes in that variable affects every other variable contemporaneously. So based on the variables we have in my example here, um, probably the best choice in, in my thinking uh, for that contemporaneously exogenous variable ordered first is going to be that uh, effective federal funds rate. The idea being uh, the federal funds rate is going to react to what happens in the stock market or at the S&P and the bond market, uh, the three-month T-bill rate, but it's probably not going to respond within a day, right? So we're thinking about primarily policy response. But when policy does change, it's going to have an immediate effect on those other variables. So it's going to show up in all the other equations contemporaneously, but it's probably not going to react that quickly. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, the variable ordered last, well, that's going to be our contemporaneously endogenous variable. It's going to react to everything else at time t, but its influence uh, isn't felt by any other variable until t plus 1. And probably the best choice uh, for that last ordered variable in this case uh, is going to be our asset return. Right? The idea being a change in one asset, even if it's a, a huge firm like Bank of America, it's probably going to have a minimal effect on the rest of the, uh, the variables and probably not a contemporaneous effect. So when we think about what our system is going to look like, if we had to take pencil to paper and write it all out, um, it might look something like, that wasn't it, this. Uh, so our B matrix, so this would be the right-hand side of our, our system equation here, relating our vector of variables right? and their coefficients in each equation. Right? So our variable ordered first, right? Everything's going to be zeroed out here, so none of these contemporaneous terms affect the current value of EFFR, so that'll be on the left-hand side. For the second equation, well, there is going to be a non-zero value in this EFFR coefficient spot, right? So EFFR is going to affect DTB3 at time t. The third equation is going to have non-zero coefficients, for the first two variables, and then the fourth is going to have non-zero coefficients for all three of the previous variables. The abbreviated versions of the equations might look like this, right? So the equation one, the federal funds rate equation, only has lags on the right-hand side, no contemporaneous terms. Equation two, uh, T-bill equation, is influenced by the federal funds rate at time T, the S&P is influenced by federal funds rate and the three-month T-bill at time T. And then finally, that last equation, the endogenous equation, uh, the asset return is affected by all three of the other variables at time T. So let's go ahead and estimate this model. So instead of the VAR basic, the command here is just going to be VAR. And it turns out uh, we can specify the uh, the Cholesky ordering that's going to go through the rest of our estimation uh, based on the order of the variables from left to right as they appear in our command here. So we want to go back and put some thought into that. So we said our first variable was going to be uh, the federal funds rate. The last variable was going to be our B of A. There's not a whole lot we can we can really look into to determine what the order of those intermediate 
variables are going to be, the T-bill rate and the S&P. So you might want to, you know, ultimately check for uh, robustness to specification. If we flip those around, how much does it change our our resulting estimates and our impulse responses, right? But for now, we'll do it in that order. So first, federal funds rate, last, uh, the asset return, B of A in this case, uh, and then our other variables in the middle. And so here, we are going to want to specify that lag structure correctly. So the option uh, lags following a comma, and we'll go from lag one to lag three. So one slash three. And the results are going to look very much like the VAR basic. It's going to give us equation by equation coefficients, make sure all our lags are there. And it's going to give our system kind of summary here. But no impulse responses are automatically generated. To get those impulse responses, we have to create them uh, with a follow up set of commands. So that's going to be this command IRF create. Uh, and we can name it name it whatever we want. So this is our our cap m uh, equivalent uh, equation here. Uh, and then again, the commands here are going to refer back to that name of our new file. So set cap m comma replace. So it will overwrite the estimate every time we do it. We'll hit enter, and so we've created a, again, kind of the, the ingredients of generating these impulse response functions uh, within SCADA. And then lastly, we want to actually create a specific set of impulse responses. Uh, and we can do this with the table of numbers, the percentage changes over a certain time horizon. Uh, and we can also do it uh, with the graph, and we'll always do it with the, the graph. So the, command here, IRF graph, and we'll use the orthogonalized option. So that's really applying the Cholesky ordering identification. Right? And then we're going to have to refer back to our file right, where all of those coefficients are stored. And then kind of our parameters here. Um, This is going to be our, our cap M impulse response file. And then we have to tell state of what variables are going to be shocked and what variables are going to respond. So our impulse variables, well, that's going to be our three variables that are not the asset price. So it's going to be the T-bill rate, federal funds rate, and uh, our S&P. So those are our three impulse variables, our response variable in this case is just going to be our B of A return. And we'll say Y line zero, we'll throw that in for that reference point. And I just realized I forgot to uh, specify the number of steps ahead in the previous command. That's okay, we'll go with the default eight steps ahead here. So we have three little graphs. And they tell us a nice little story. So we'll kind of start in the upper left here. So this is the response of our asset return to a positive shock in the T-bill rate. And we see that Y line zero never peaks out above or below that 95% confidence interval. So we see there's really no significant response of the asset return to a shock in the three-month T-bill rate. We definitely see a positive response here that is significant. So we see when there's a positive innovation to the S&P return, our prediction, our forecast for our B of A return increases here by one percentage point. And then it immediately comes back down to zero. So the forecasted impact is temporary, positive, and significant. Right? and a magnitude of about 1%. Uh, now with the response to a federal funds rate shock, I thought this was kind of interesting. I wasn't sure if we were going to pick anything up here. And we see just for the beginning of that first period that uh, that zero line peaks out from 
the top of the upper bound of our 95% confidence interval. Uh, so that tells us that we have a very temporary negative significant response. Uh, then we see it comes back up and then go, basically goes to zero. But when the federal funds rate goes up, we see a tight monetary policy. We see an increase in the cost of acquiring funds to banks. And that's consistent with kind of a decrease in the profitability of banks and associated with a negative uh, response to the asset return. So it's not uh, you know, not super dramatic uh, response, but it makes sense. The direction uh, and the significance level does make sense. So that's what you want to be able to do, be able to communicate uh, the intuition. What story are these uh, impulse responses telling us? How sensitive are they to the identification scheme that we used? Um, and that's that's the VAR in Stata. Uh, so good times. I'll see you guys next time.